All right, everybody. Good evening. Good morning. Good night. Midday. Wherever you're tuning in from. Today is the most special outreach that you can imagine with the GOAT, Kelly Slater. Um, this is uh, something that's been kind of in the works for a little bit because uh, Kelly is... Personally, I have to say that Kelly is one of the coolest... Uh, I don't know. To Patrick, Dane and I, he has always been one of the coolest guys. He really takes the time to make the time. And whether it's he came down to some of the Stoker Amas when it was like our first years, only guy there, fully free surfed in expression sessions. And when I uh, talked to him about what I was doing here, he was down. He was super, super down. And we finally found the time. He's currently in Australia, hence why we're on the Tom Carroll Hour. That's what we're calling it now. And uh, today, of course, we're going to be breaking down Kelly Slater Black and White. Now, it's been a rainy, rainy couple days here. So I wanted to extend the intro, and I played Kelly Slater in color. This was a K-Grip movie made. This is before. This is made after. This, to me, hit home really hard. This was like when I was like 10, 11, 12 or something. And these sections, the music, everything in this video is beyond iconic. This, however, could be the most impactful movie of our time. I feel like this is something that if you had a top five and you threw this down, ain't nobody in that room going to hate on you. So good to know. Again, this has been such a fun experiment. Uh, the outreach in general has grown to a point of uh, having guys like the greatest all-time surfer on, and I'm still just doing it out of my room. Uh, it's a live stream here, so you never know what you're going to get. So I do want to just mention and shout out all the viewers and everybody who's spreading the good word on this thing. It really feels like a subculture movement of just celebrating these movies and the culture of those times, but then adding in that we get to catch up with the surfers or cinematographers in them is like that cherry on top of the cake, which has grown to a whole nother level. Um, you know, I'm thinking back and uh, the Nathan Fletcher one for me still is so crazy because these colors taste like music, a Sonny Miller film. He had so many insights of working with Sonny. Lisa Anderson, again with Sonny Miller, did The Shimmer, the Roxy movie. And then we played Blue, sorry, Blue Crush by Bill Ballard and got in contact with Bill Ballard. And he was stoked on what we were doing. So I think the doors are just opening. It's funny because surfing's grown to become such a global thing. Yet at the same time, I think something like this, it really makes you feel like as a surfer, you have so much in common with a surfer. And the culture really is it. it, it it's a, it's a tight knit community because we just love sharing that feeling of being a surfer and identifying as that. So um, I am gonna see here. This is an interesting one today. So and I'm gonna explain this right now. Is that we're gonna do an inst. This will be for for everybody out there. The viewing experience is gonna be the same. I'm gonna literally film my phone, but we're gonna do this on Instagram. Um, because Kelly was saying, I sent him the Tom Carroll one. He was all fired up to watch. And he's like, dude, I couldn't find it. Like, where was it? And so he gave me some really good guidance of making the conversations as accessible as possible. And so, again, the goatliness, uh, I just took that to heart. And, and, I, and what we're doing needs to be shared as much and as, as echoing as it can. Because, you know, the core surfing ethos is something that still lives in all of us. So I thought... That's an amazing call. Kelly and I are figuring it out. I kind of did a little research today on how to do it, but I don't know whether I joined one of his or he joins one of mine. But anyways, it's going to be right here if you want that experience or if you want it on your phone, either way. But always come back to this because then we will show the movie. And uh, that's how that's going to go down. So what else can I say? Um, thinking, and this is a, a point of curiosity. So if you can, hit me up any way that you can if you've been viewing this show. I'm thinking about potentially scaling down, trying to do one every day, and potentially doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or maybe Monday and Friday, so then we can all focus and spread the word and let the marination of these things kind of echo so people can tune in and be really excited about it. Um, certain ones I was thinking about and talking about today was doing a dichotomy of the Transworld Surf videos, kind of going through all the back catalog of those. Um, Chris Malloy has been in touch and, and I think his, I mean he alone, we could go through and, and be talking about Thicker Than Water, One Track Mine, and then almost open up the Malloy vault because those guys have shifted culture and shared so much of their viewpoint in 
who they are, but then that ethos within surfing. So that would be super fun. But I think just making it a longer format here on the show, but not having it be every day. I know we're all in lockdown and these last couple days have been super gnarly because it's been so rainy. Um, so just hit me up, give me your feedback. If you guys are, if it's 100% go every day, then I will. So that's my promise to you. Um, okay, so I think what I might do here is I'm going to turn this off and then I'm going to set this up so that I will be uh, ready to go and I'll just start up a live and we'll see if Kelly gets on. How about that? Is that how I do it? Does anybody know how we do it? Let's see here. We're going to miss that uh, that FaceTime call, aren't we? We're going to miss the sound of that thing. Okay, so it is live here, so you got to go there, create the live. Bam. Okay, we're checking the connection, I guess, but that's cool. That gives us time to get set up. Okay, all right, all right. Not bummed on that. Let me see here. Bring you up. I'm gonna bring you up. I'm gonna bring you up. Okay, there we go. Up, oh, Kelly, text. Yeah, perfect. Okay, that's great. Here we go. Standing by the goatliness. Let's see, I think this is how you do it. Kelly Slater, greatest surfer of all time. Okay, let's see a return. Maybe not. Maybe I'll see. Go live. Sorry, guys. This is... How do I do this? Hold on. Going live. Man, this is... this is Now you're getting a really good viewpoint on... Maybe request? Kelly Slater. hey -o. Oh, guys, I'm calling up Alex Kilowano. He's here in the room with us. He's having a beer at his place. AK, I hope you're well. Um, okay, let's just see what's going to happen here. Okay, I'm going to have to say I started one. Sorry, this is a bit of a different experience here for us all. Get me back. Get me back. Get me back. This is like a YouTube tutorial on itself. And then I did this. Okay, bam. Okay, boom. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is so epic. How's that hair, T Boy? Somebody writes. Wow, was that. Oh wow. Crano's on. Wait, who was that? Was that David? Hey. Oh, sick. Yes. What's up? This is, uh, this is my first full live, and I'm kind of fired up on this. Oh, is it really? Have you been doing these a lot? Uh, yeah, I've been doing them like almost every day with people. Have you done anything else besides Instagram Lives? Um, I did a Zoom thing yesterday with uh, a buddy of mine, Kelly James. With um, It was pretty cool. He's a, he's a musician. Um, <clears throat> kind of like a impromptu, off-the-top-of-his-head rapper. He, he gets hired to play all these parties and stuff. Freestyle. He's kind of in the golf world, so he got Justin Thomas... It was like, I don't know what Justin is right now. He was former number one in the world. I think he's like number three in the world right now or something. And then um, he had, and Steph Curry. So the four of us just talked <laughs> for like an hour yesterday. Sorry, so Steph Curry like, just called in. Let's see what he's saying. Yeah, he's buddies, he's buddies with uh, Steph. Kelly, Kelly James plays all these golf things. And through the golf world, he's friends with like all sorts of different athletes and musicians and stuff. It's pretty cool. And that's what I love when we were texting, like the variety of who you're connecting with in this time probably has got to be one of the most unique <laughs> approaches. You had like a yeah, fighter, a yeah. chef. What's that? You had like the fighter, you had the chef, you had it all in like one day. Yeah. So I did it with uh, Pete Evans, who's like kind of the, he's kind of known as the paleo chef. Um, pretty well known here in Australia. Um, Fellow surfer rides our boards and stuff. Sick. And then yeah, we did. I did a thing with Vitor Belfort the other day. Vitor's an old friend of mine. He lives in Florida now, but I met him in Brazil and Rio with Shane and Ross when we were like in our early mid twenties, and he was like 18, 20 years old. And uh, for any any fight fans out there, you might remember that uh, he had a fight with Vanderlei Silva, 
and Vondelay was like world champ at the time from K1 or Pride or whatever and, and um, Vitor was like 18 or 20 years old and he, he came out and knocked him out in like 10 seconds and uh, just shocked the world oh, um, good so night he's, he's, he's been called the phenom since he was a young guy but uh, he's a beast are you finding that everybody's basically universally spending their time the same way through COVID yes all Yes, here we are. <laughs> Dude, um, hey, well, just uh, thank you so much for doing this, Kelly. Yeah, I might move around for a second. I'll keep talking, but I'm just getting my toast. I'm Easy. Dude, let's let, let's just go ahead and recreate the intro scene of Kelly Slater Black and White right now. Just pull out the cereal. Oh, yeah, I might, actually. <laughs> Damn it, this thing's not working. I got, this, uh, I got this toaster that pops up, like... It doesn't do its thing, you know? Oh, yeah. Come on. Oh, gosh. That's like my uh, VHS TV. It's basically like... You still got a VHS? Yeah, hold on. Here, check this out. This is the rig right here. <laughs> oh. Yes. So, I've had that forever. Patrick, Dane, and I always watch these videos. And then when I moved out of the house... Uh, and I just collected all these videos. So, I've been watching them religiously. And that's kind of why I started this was because... It's there's so much culture in these movies, and I just feel like it's cool to share. Like a lot of people can't see these kind of movies. Uh oh, spinning wheel of death. Hold on, he'll come back, guys. He'll come back. He always does. This is so Kelly. Kelly. <laughs> Uh oh, I think he's jamming it up right here. Something happened with that toaster oven. Now we're seeing the other side of the lockup on bad service here. But we're good on our end. We're streaming. We'll see what's going to happen. People are still commenting in for Kelly. That's up. Oh, somebody's got a VHS too. Core Lord. Um, also, if you guys are tuned in on the outreach, Go to the YouTube and send a comment because I'm going to totally flare this up. I want to just have the people be heard. Oh, I'm out. Okay. How do I do this? What's going on here? Oh, man. Okay, hold on. Oh, view. There we go. Bam. What's up? Why can't I do this? Is it my phone? No, it's not mine. Hold on. Let's see here. Sorry, guys. This is a little bit clunky. What is up? Uh. Okay, I'm just gonna start a new one here. This is so weird, okay. The live experiment continues on. We're making it work though, technology. I'm sure a lot of people are having this universal problem right now. Okay, here we go, we're live. No viewers, that's okay, that's that's a general story. <laughs> it's happening. Okay, come on, come on. Let's go here. I don't know if this works. Kelly, there he is. Okay, now I click it, right? My <laughs> what is up? Oh, maybe I'm on. Hold on. Jimmy Wilson hits in. Yes, he knows. Okay, so I'm live. Let's go. Let's be there. Kelly? Add. Okay. Wow, the force with you, young Jedi, Nate Yeomans, is there. 
Jaka, sorry. What what did we do right there? Uh, uh, Jim Jim Miller called me a couple times and the phone cut out. What my, connection? Yeah. yeah, I'm getting my. I'm just making my breakfast. What's where are we at? Where did what did I miss? Okay, so you missed. I was just about to cut into Kelly Slater Black and White, of course, which I don't have to say the full name anymore. We're just gonna call it Black and White. Uh, but I was really curious. Um, at that point, when you were making that movie, because you were so young, was there a lot of profile movies for young surfers at that point, or was that kind of a groundbreaking thing? No, there wasn't, and that'll, that will lead into when we get into the, the, the surf, um, my favorites later, but no, there really weren't many like signature films or anything like that. Um, in fact, I'm, I can't really think of any, but there, there may have been on somebody, but I don't know. It, what it was... <clears throat> originally it was just going to be a little marketing piece for Quicksilver and um, it was going to be like a five minute long uh, like introduction like welcome to the team kind of thing just a, a really short quick little thing and um, it just I, I actually signed my contract on the beach at Lowers during that PSA contest that they have in there um, so that was right when I signed with Quick and then I won that contest and then they were like, oh, we're thinking about doing this Tavarua trip, and maybe we'll just extend the movie to then. And then we got a bunch of good footage then, and they, they, then they started realizing, like, oh, this might be, like, just a good sort of full-length surf uh, film, you know, like a signature thing. And and Wooly was super just amped on the whole thing, and obviously gave him an excuse to go to Tavarua, and next thing you know, we're filming through Hawaii, and that kind of put the pressure on me, you know, at 18 years old to like step up and start actually riding big waves, <laughs> <laughs> sort of get myself out there. And, and, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, Ross Clark Jones kind of alludes to it in there. You know, he's like, he says something about if Kelly can, you know, basically learn how to surf big waves, then he's got a future. So but, that was it. I, I honestly was, was really touching in on that note from Ross was like, at that point to prove yourself in Hawaii, it was even gnarlier than it is now, but you had to go against guys like the Quicksilver team at that point was Titans, right? Like who were you surrounded by in Hawaii? Um, well, you know, Quicksilver made all the hooey trunks, you know, so they sponsored the black shorts and, Oh wow. I didn't know that. And, uh, you know, originally before there was the hooey, um, clothing, you know, and, um, so, you know, Quicksilver was really just like implanted in, in the North Shore with Mickey Nielsen and Martin Foster and Eddie and, and um, you know, you just go on and on down the list. So, you know, for a, for a young kid coming from, from the mainland to the North Shore, it was the best sponsor you could have, you know, because guys were on your team. And um, so essentially Marvin really looked out for me for a lot of years and just made sure I was getting a few waves and Rad. You know, doing my thing and, and um, Perry Dane I was hanging with Perry a lot when I was young and um, uh, you know Perry was on the quick program and, and then Chava um, and you know we spent some time with Chava and Kauai and we went to Fiji together and stuff and it, it just uh you know, Marino's Hayes, who's now coaching a bunch of guys right now, is on the team, and obviously Boothy, and you get yeah. Tom Carroll, and all the Aussies, and Ross Clark, and Dave McCauley. Um, you know, I was I was traveling with all those guys, and uh, I mean, look, when I was when I was out of a sponsor, I thought I was going to ride for Gotcha because that the winter prior to to that, th this was um, 1990. Whoa, but in in 89, 90, that winter, I was hanging out at the Gotcha house. I was sleeping there. I, I was, like, ready to put logos on. I had a, whole, a full Gotcha wardrobe already. And I, I wanted to ride for Gotcha, but then they didn't offer me a very good deal when it came down to it. And it was, like, between Gotcha and OB. And I went on a trip down to Mexico, and my, my then manager said, when you get back, we'll have a deal, and you'll, you know, you'll be set up, whatever it's going to be. And so I thought it was gonna be one or the other, and I was, I was really hoping it was gonna be Gotcha. I was really dreading riding for OP again. Dude, and, um, wait, was that because uh, Surfers the movie? You have that interview in in that movie. Is that around that time that? Or is yeah, that, that was around that time. Yeah, that was kind of like the the Surfers the movie thing. I was sixteen, 
so there was uh, I was I was already kind of hanging around around hanging out around the Gotcha crew at the off the wall houses and stuff. And then it was like a year later that it got serious. Like my OP, I was I signed with with uh, I signed with OP right then. But then a year later, I was it was only a one year contract with OP and Rip Curl that I was with. Okay. So I was kind of in, um, which was which I look back on really thankfully now because that um, kind of got me in there with Tom, you know, because Tom was OP. Obviously, it was Channel Island, so oh. I was I was, I was uh, you know Tom was always my favorite. And I, I really looked up to him a lot, and um, uh, so you know I became close with Al at, when I was when I was sixteen is when I started riding Al's boards. In fact, in Surfers the movie, that's the first set of boards I ever got from Al with the, was the board I was riding in there. That's pretty sick too. In in black and white, you have the heavy heat and Lockenau with Tommy, and he's still yeah. OP at that point. Yeah, it's cool. Like I don't know, man. There's there's so many synchronicities that have happened throughout my life, and. Uh, I, I look back on it sometimes and just can't believe all of them, but that that was kind of one of them, you know, because a year before that, I was, I had never been to France, I was riding for OP, I was, uh, I was <clears throat> with, um, staying with Tom and Marie, Leanne was six months old, she'd just been born, and Tom was, like, a little worried about having someone stay at the house with him, so he actually put me in a hotel for a couple days, uh, near them, and then, um, uh, it, it was it, what a great time though. Funny though, I spent like two weeks in France with Tom. That was '89 in August, I think. And um, uh, I think I only surfed with him maybe three or four times in the two weeks I was there because he put me on baby duty. So I would, I would be, uh, he'd be either in the studio or going surfing, and he asked me to babysit if Marie was doing something. And then you know, so he might go surf, and I would babysit, and then he'd come back, and I'd go surf. And we're kind of doing shifts. Is uh, and, um, is is Tom? Is he one of the guys that kind of got you into music, or had I'm just thinking correlating because um, Tommy is it, phenomenal. It me, for sure, I was I was like interested because Tom played, but I didn't really learn to play with Tom at all. I, a, a very little bit when I when I first started playing guitar, I was like 18. Like at that time at Tom's house, I didn't even play anything at all yet. And then about a year later, I started playing, and I was in Hawaii in the winter and. Jack and I were trying to write some songs. Jack Johnson at, at that point. Came over. What's that? Did you say Jack Johnson at that point? Yeah, Jack. Yeah, yeah. Jack and I kind of learned how to play together. And then we actually wrote a few songs together. What? And, um, Deep and, cuts. Uh, yeah. I, uh, in fact, Jack brought one up the other day. We, I was at his house and and, um, uh, and he goes, hey, you know, he goes, remember that one song? Try to escape the bedlam. He's like, that, that, um, uh, Harmony always comes into my head. He goes, I always think of that, uh, the, the melody of that song. And it's like one of the first songs we did. We made like two or three songs together. And Dude, you guys should fully time. send it right now. Make an album. I heard I heard that uh, Thicker Than Water, who was uh, Taylor Steele was saying, Thicker Than Water, Chris Molloy had to convince Jack Johnson to use those songs in it because he was like a little, in, not embarrassed, but like kind of was didn't know if it was good enough or something. Like, what? This guy's voice is complete honey. You know, but song, Jack's songs weren't in Thicker Than Water, were they? Dude, that's what, was it, thick, was he's, it Thicker Than Water or was it in September Session? So he said Thicker Than Water was pivotal in that moment because it's the first time Jack's songs were used. I think Jack is on the title of September Sessions as like uh, the producer or something or different, but he said that that was the first time he'd heard his songs in a movie. Could be wrong. I don't know. So there's a... There's a piece in there that cuts from being in, with Conan in downtown um, New York, in Manhattan, on the streets, and then they're all of a sudden, I think, in Ireland. And there's this black guy playing guitar in the streets, and he's singing, I got dreams, dreams to remember. And then Jack went home, and he, he grabbed his guitar, and he... He decided to try and play something to match that, to fit that sound, soundtrack. So if you go back and look at that section, Jack had this guitar. One of the tuning pegs wouldn't move, so he had to tune everything around that note. And it was exactly fit to that guy's voice. Dude, this is sick. That's the kind of stuff I want to do. I'm going to go back and I'm going to watch that. Yeah. So that section, find that section where the guy's singing, and then it goes into guitar playing, and it's Jack because he just dubbed over it. 
So give us some. He was exactly in tune with that guy's voice. Give us something deeper like that on black and white. I mean, so many people, Kelly. Like it's literally one of the most impactful movies. I don't know. Like definitely in my collection is like, but the thicker than water. No, black and white, dude. Like no, your white. your yeah. lower section, like the the star trunks. You literally have like the most like. Is it Wooly in the background who came up with the all-time line, like, this is the morning of the finals? Wooly came up with everything. So, that movie, when I talk about synchronicities, like, that that film, you know, is so personal to me. Because, like, you, you're talking about um, the, the, there's black and white and there's color. Yep. And I was thinking about it today, like, a lot of people did, like, color, but to me it was like a propaganda film. Well, because the advertisement in it, right? Like that little one where you're like a Cupid flying? Yeah, like, I just was like embarrassed by that. But I was like, I was really, with black and white, I was super, I was so excited. But I was so shy also about it. Um, And I was even shy to have them film me, like, and ask me questions or anything. So the intro to that, where... um, JT, he comes on with the glasses. He's like, "Do not copy this film. Do not share this or whatever." Dude, and what? Then, screw that guy. Get that film. Give it all to your friends. I know. <laughs> and I look back at that now, and I, I, I watch me talking, and all I can see is how nervous I was. <laughs> I was so scared to be on camera. And then, like my interview where I'm at on Tavarua, John Freeman wants to inter- he wanted to interview me and talk about the trip. And I was, I used to be so embarrassed to do interviews in front of people. I made them walk halfway around the island to film me in the bushes so that they could see us. Because I was so nervous. And I almost like wanted to turn the camera on and leave because I used to just get so like nervous in front of the camera. And, well, and you know, I, I realized it was going to be like a, a kind of a big film for our world, right? Um, so I was really, I was really uh, scared about it just not being good. I just um, love how you're literally sleeping in a sleeping bag at whoever's house before lowers it's you're in trunks at lowers which i like that's rare as days to have the water that warm and mm-hmm. but what was and I'm a, that and I'm a bus too. i don't like cold <laughs> water man but what about that because you've won i think the most out of anybody at lowers but what about that victory is makes it beyond iconic is it in that that movie or was it the surf about at that time this is like this goes back into like those synchronicities for me because like that was my first win as a pro. I won a couple of pro am, a pro events as a kid. Okay. But that was my first win uh, once, since I turned pro, and it was at Lowers. And Tom Curran won his first contest ever at Lowers. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was his first pro win, uh, first win as a pro. So I just felt such a connection there with Tom, and then you know, like I said, I spent. The year before, I was on OP at 17 years old, staying at Tom's house. He's showing me the ropes. The next year, I'm surfing against him and locking out. And I'm a Quicksilver guy. And But that's um, not... So that... Because you reference it like, oh, I made some heats, and then I was into the main event there at locking out. That... Was the surf about like a QS event, and then locking out was a CT, or were they the same? Locking out was a CT. The, the tr- trestles was a, was a PSAA. Okay. And the cool thing about the events back then was that each heat you won, you won an extra hundred bucks. So there's always a bonus to win your heat. Skins. So if you look at my turn, if you look at my check, I served seven rounds, and I won six heats. So you had. Um, so I made thirty thousand six hundred dollars. Then I remember being like, honestly, like as stoked about the six hundred as the thirty thousand. Yes, dude. So funny. <laughs> well, I mean, the movie. It was like, it was like this notch on your belt. I'm spitting my food out here. It was like a notch on your belt. You know, when you go surf those PSAs, it, it was like a symbol of how many heat you won. And so it, it was a little bit of a pride thing. And it was it was just cool that they, you know, Ronnie Maestro and those guys had the foresight of body love when they were running PSA to think of that stuff. Like, that was really, it was just something we all got soaked on. Like, oh, I made an extra hundred bucks, you know? That's another day of food and... But also, too, it makes it unique. Like, you would say the year you won, you're like, oh, it was 30,600. And it's like, somebody's either got to do that or do better. Like, oh, I got to 30,700. That means I won, you know, whatever, however many heats. It's like a true yeah. win, you know? And I think, the, I think the heat I lost was a semifinal with Chris Brown. I think Chris beat me in the semis. Of that contest? 
Yeah, it was four men each. Oh, but on the podium, I thought you lift the trophy. Or no, you get the check? No, he beat me in the semifinal. So oh. I didn't win the semifinal. Chris did. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so- yeah. yeah. Okay. I had to yeah. think NSSA. I had to go back to the four-man heat scenario. Yeah. But Chris uh, Brown, dude, that's, I mean, you guys are super tight. He's right up there with you on the podium. Chris was the man. I mean, you know, for for about four years before that, Chris and I were pretty much best friends. We traveled all together, surfed on U.S. teams together. We surfed in England. Um, we surfed in uh, Australia together. Um we, we did trips to Mexico and uh, like down to, to Cabo and El uh, Natividad. Uh, I stayed with him in the summertime. We shaped boards. We shaped a board together. That's I, actually a funny story. I I told that story at Chris's funeral where we decided to shape this board. We got a blank from Al. We took it to Chris's backyard. And we he's like, all right, you shape that rail and I'll shape this rail. And you know, Florida had these rails and California had these rails. It was a real different 50-50. I mean, that was the true asymmetric. True. Way before, yes. Way before these hipsters now, man. I actually <laughs> wanted to ask you about boards because you have such a high surfboard IQ. And I know your brother shapes boards and you were super tight with Al. But do you remember at what point it was that you sort of like started to really understand how they move and how you can change them? Well, that probably came from Keckley. Sick. Because Matt. Because Matt shaped me and Sean's boards for so long, and he worked. He was <clears throat> he was shaping with Quiet Flight. So Matt, he originally rode for a company called Ocean Avenue, which what? was run by Bruce Walker, owned by Bruce Walker, and it was a surf and skate team, and it was definitely the best team in Florida and on the East Coast, and I would argue one of the best teams current during those times for any any team in the states ever. Um, you know, obviously not matching what, uh, you know, Mayhem has done or what, what Al has done, but it was a real force like Ocean Avenue. Um, uh, but Matt wanted to shape there and, and Bruce Walker wouldn't let him. So Matt, that's the story Matt told me anyways. And so Matt left and, and the guys at, Ocean, at Quiet Flight supported him. And, and then Matt brought me and Sean in. And uh, Matt actually grew up on 3rd Street in Cocoa Beach back on the river and that's the that's the street that goes straight up to the beach that everyone in Cocoa Beach learned how to surf on and it was called the Islander Hut and we used to see Matt out there as a kid and uh then we saw him in a magazine one day when we were probably like 10 years old and we were like oh my god that's that guy like that surfs at our beach Matt Kachil Kachili Matt Kachil <laughs> and um but anyways we, came, we became really good friends with Matt and we rode for Sun Deck and Matt kept with surfboards and Matt shaped our boards, so, you know, that's that's really how Sean and I got probably our first look at board shaping, because we'd go in with Matt, and he would just show how he does it, and and um, and then when I was about, I don't know, 14, I shaped, I, 13, maybe I shaped a board with some friends, because I used to, my friend, my best buddy at home didn't surf, and he had a boat, and we used to go hydro slide behind his boat, you know, like the knee board. Yeah, <laughs> heck yeah. <laughs> and, uh. So we, we actually shaped a, uh, a, a hydro slide, that's what we called it. <laughs> Dude, and, uh, bring that thing back. Let's draw some I mean, inspiration I, I, off I, that. I wonder if it's in his mom's garage somewhere. I, I wish, we called it, we called it the JTEC because it, because it was four of us that liked to go. It was, um, the other three guys were John, Tom, and Eric, and I was Kelly, so JTEC. JTEC. Dude, that's <laughs> core. Hey, I was curious because, I mean, you... We, I, we talked with Reynolds about his contribution at Lowers with the Dumpster Diver, but I believe it was that same year where you started pushing boards real short and competing on them. I was at the Wizard Sleeve or something, but you've always been in that realm of pushing equipment in heats. Um, is it just for you? Is it just fun? Is it to push yeah, people's fun. mind? And I think I had so much time. On just the standard traditional equipment that I'm, I, I just inevitably, um, you know, I would use the verb suffered from, like, just being a little bit bored with the same feeling over and over. Whereas, like, you get a good board that's just like a standard thruster and it feels great. And if you come back to that after riding something that you're trying to experiment with for a long time, it feels amazing. But you end up drawing the same lines and looking at the wave the same way. So 
I think, I, you know, I feel like maybe that's what happened with Curran um, for a lot of time because he's been riding such such out there equipment, you know. Like, yeah. Obviously, I've taken some some uh, liberties with short boards and four fins and wide point forward short boards and things like that. And occasionally it pays off, you know. Like, I mean, I, I, I made that uh, board we called the Deep Six. It was a 510, but it rode, you know, it was designed to ride like a 7.0. That was huge. I remember you know? those. And, and uh, I, won, I won the Pipe Masters on it. So, you know, once in a while, you, you find gold. Yeah, for but, sure. <laughs> what do you think, though, like, with looking at where the areas that could use that sort of mentality and improvement, let's say airs, let's say big waves, let's say tubes, like, where do you think is the most that you could contribute with a new format or surfboard? I mean, you guys must be talking about it with the surfboard company, like, is it big wave stuff, or do you think there can get more rotation out of a surfboard? Well, if you're thinking in terms of like a, your company trying to sell boards, you're not going to be making big wave boards. Like no one buys big wave. You but got, maybe not as a company. Yeah. Maybe not because that is true. Like you, then you're dealing with like a whole nother thing. But for you personally, like where do you think you could improve in area? Um, I I never am thinking about um, designing really for anyone else like I'm not thinking like make this and someone will like this board you know for me it's like I just follow what I like and then can that fit into a product or whatever but um, I think I really think every single person on the east coast and a lot of people on the west coast should be on twin fins at least have one in their in their quiver because they're they're so much faster through flat sections and they're so much more maneuverable and they teach you they teach your feet those little subtle motor skills, and yet, you know, they're really sensitive. At the same time, you can hold a long turn on them. So, I don't know, I just, I feel like we've all gone down this rabbit hole of thrusters with a lot of rocker and... I mean, that know. that's a Aquila you were riding in Japan, right? That thing looked phenomenal. Was that a twin Yeah, thing? I was riding an Aquila. The waves were tiny, and I was having a blast. Dude, Loved it. that looks so good. But here's another, you know, just a, there's a misconception by people. I, I think... The average person thinks that, um, you know, the bigger the wave, the more fin you need, and it's like the exact opposite, and it, it's so evident in small waves, you know, when you're at a tiny wave, you need a lot of fin, because there's nothing to create lift and, and push against, that's why twin fins are so big, but, you know, I remember, I, I know a few pros have talked about going on a trip with fewer boards, but taking big fins for big waves, and it, it doesn't make sense, you need a small fin, you know, a fighter jet doesn't have a big Boeing wing on it. I mean, but you've always been down on the fin thing. I feel like out of a lot of the pros, you're so open about talking and switching fins and heats and stuff. Like your your fin IQ is much higher than a lot of people. Oh, give me a second. I'll show you a fin. I'll show you some fins I'm working on. Standing by. I mean, so far, we got to be like fired up. Yeah, because the fin thing, it's... I mean, it's definitely a vortex hole for me. I, I basically just end up one fin and I switch up the boards. It's kind of cool. So, yeah, the, um, so, you know, that's that's my standard fin template, yep. right? Like, this is, this is a K3, which I rode forever. Yes. And then this is what I've been riding lately. Wait, and is this back fins? That's front fin. Oh, oh, okay. Wow, dude. Right. That's... So I've been riding this. So you, see, you can see the length and the the the, uh, the difference in the in the template there. It's oh. like night and day. What are you pairing that with? What's the trailer? I'm going to quads. I'm going five uh, fins. Okay. Actually, I've been riding five fins, and um, it's it's blowing my mind. So. <laughs> Dang, dude. And I've been riding it in small waves. Like a lot of times, I think. Like, the five fins are good in barrels, and they're not as sharp, like, in the pocket and stuff, but I, I, I got this combo right now that feels pretty insane, so I'm just kind of working it out. That is, I mean, standing by on that, but that fin had a lot of rake on it. That's incredible. A ton of rake, and it flexes a whole lot, too. Like, the tip of these things, I don't know, you can even see that, but... Is that good? I don't even, I mean, that's above my head already. Well, the base to about here is really stiff, and then this is all, like... It's almost like it's taking the shape of the face or the curve you're riding on. Um, but in I that, had, uh, in the fin I realm, had Steph Gilmore, I had Steph Gilmore ride one of my boards the other day with it 
So I have this like really out there board design. Not really out there, but if I told you it on paper, like just in numbers, it would sound like it makes no sense. Okay. Uh oh. Don't do it. Come on back. We're here for you. Oh gosh. What is happening over there? I went down the other road one of my boards. And then she got back. Hey, that's a good thing though, I guess. You're you're opening a mind yeah. up. It's just I don't know. I, I think there's always if if everyone was experimenting based on the, the feel they want to have and understanding of board design and how to get that and where you want to go on a wave and like is your mind limited by what you already know about riding a wave or is it open to the idea that you could ride in different places in the pocket blah blah so you know you, and if you understand some design you can you can work around those things but like I'm on a board right now where the fins are at least a, an inch further forward than they normally are it's got an extended tail behind the fins. The board's only like 5'8", and it's under 18 inches wide, and it's two and almost two and a half inches thick. Like, it doesn't really make sense. It's got a super boxy rail. And uh, the number of people this week that have been like, that board looks insane, what is that? Like, under my feet, meaning like the, the lines it draws. Yeah. And it's like, it's, to me, it's such positive feedback, because... <clears throat> Had we been had the tour started right now, I probably wouldn't be on this board. So it's just giving me time to really experiment and but look at. I want to know it, with everything that you've developed and kind of experimented on since the point of these movies. Would you ever just grab yourself a six three bladed out elf shoe rockered out like oh two two and like a, an eighth thick just hair rail carbon strip surfboard again? Is that ever going to get back into your quiver? Come on, for the people, dude! It is insane. It does look great. At least yeah. once. Promise me one. There's certain people you break up with, you just never go back. There. <laughs> certain surfboards. Gosh, all right. Well, hey, at least you gave us these great movies, which I, I want to well, do. I want them. I want them in my quiver, like just to be at my house. I don't really. And you know what? I, I mean, I'd be interested to ride them again one day, but. Al and I were just, we were trying to create a certain thing. We were trying to get, we were trying to figure out how to ride tighter in the pocket and be more maneuverable. And strangely enough, like the, the narrowness didn't make sense um, in one sense. So the narrowness, it's, it's really hard to get that board up and going on a small wave. But to counter that, the rocker was pretty flat between the feet. But then to become more maneuverable, we had a lot of tail kick. And that idea really started for me when I surfed here on the Gold Coast when I was 15, and I went and surfed with Jason Buttonshaw. Remember Butto from Beyond Blazing Boards or any of those old films? No. Oh, okay. So you got to go and, and look up Jason Buttonshaw, Butto. So Butto and Nikki Woods were like the best young teenagers in the world. Butto was winning pro contests at like 14 here in Australia. Okay. And um, like... He was already beating rabbit and stuff when he was like a little grown. Really interesting. But he had these boards with these crazy tail rockers, and that was kind of what spurred on the idea for me and, and, and talking to Al. Um, but when we narrowed the board up, what it did with that narrow straight template was when you did get on a wave with some power in it, the thing would hold a nice line. You could really you could really hold a nice long line. I mean, you can tell so it, the, definitely because I don't. The right wave, with the right wave, it was great, but you know, the narrowest sort of most effed up dimensions I ever got um, was a board that was six one, seventeen and an eighth, two inches thick, and I took that thing up to its high tide steamer lane and wanted to kill myself. I bet you could even yeah. cross country ski on that thing, like just throw it under <laughs> one foot. <laughs> couldn't get up to <laughs> <in> that thing. <laughs> no, but I took it up to Santa Cruz and surfed this contest in, in 94. And uh, I remember how bad 
bad the board felt and how slow I felt on the waves. We were granted, like, steamer lane is not the best wave on its best day, but at high tide, small, backwashy, mushy steamers that's like three foot, it's like you're going backwards. It has a lot of personality. Um, you could say that. You could, ride a, you could ride a wide twin fin and have trouble out there, and I was on this thing. I had a... And, uh, I have a question. A I have a question for you, you Kelly. That? I, uh, I'm curious because I have always looked up to you guys and I've always watched the videos and I asked Mick, I was like, dude, like how hard were you working on creating these videos? He's like, fuck my, like I was surfing comps and these things were just coming out. It wasn't putting any effort into it. But for you, do you feel like, let's just say color. We also have clean slate letting go. There's so many videos that you've given to the culture side that obviously allow us to connect in on your contest side but do you feel like you've given effort to that side or is it just a byproduct of being in a world champion run or world title run you, sorry just, i missed a, i missed a part of that given effort to what to so what specifically? do you feel like looking back you have put efforts specifically into creating these videos or are they a byproduct of just going for a world title um, well no i mean for us, it was kind of, um, hold on, I'm just going to move so I can sit down and relax a little bit. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the videos, the videos to me were, they were like a, I guess there was some, you know, slightly competitive aspect to it, but it was like, look, if all your friends are going to be in this film, if, if all the contemporaries, all the best guys or whatever, you want to put in your best effort, especially with the Taylor films, because we're all good friends with Taylor. Um, my film, uh, Black and White, that was the first time I was really exposed to doing something like that. And, uh, it was, um, it was, it was nerve wracking for me because I was always just trying to get the best footage I could. You know, I went back through like hundreds of hours of footage at, at my home break that we had shot from when we were little kids. And I think they used about 45 seconds of it. <laughs> Sick. I spent like weeks looking through all that stuff and I time coded all this stuff for Wooly and sent it all to him and like in a huge box of like, you know, 50 VC VHS tapes and, uh, and literally it was like less than one minute of footage from it. I didn't know that Richard Wolcott was, I mean, I just didn't know he was there at Quicksilver. He, he helped with this movie before he had even started him and Troy Eckert's journey into everything that Volcom created video wise. Yeah. So that's kind of what I wanted to get into with this was... There's there's a lot of history in black and white that a lot of people don't know that that know the film. Um, yes. You know, specifically with the music is a big thing. So so Mother Love Bone, um, Wooly loved them. He really got into the grunge scene. Was starting to become friends with a bunch of those bands up in Seattle and that kind of thing. And he's like, this is the next band. And anyways, he got the rights for Mother Love Bone. <clears throat> he also worked with Dennis Dragon from uh, Surfer Punk's fame at. Uh, if you if you have any of the old surfer punks, uh, sorry, surf punks um, bands back in the day, the guys from Malibu Zone. Oh yeah, my beach. But, yeah, my beach, my way. <laughs> which was also one of my favorite albums as a little kid. I mean, it was funny. My my parents had no problem with me listening to that in ACDC as a little eight year old. How, how sick is the but, cover of the surf punks album? It's just genius. So sick. So Wooly picked out that music and and that became the soundtrack and. Um, and then the singer died. And then uh, Mother Love Bone became Pearl Jam when they found Eddie. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, obviously, you see, you didn't know that. There's so many people who don't know that. Wow. Um, so did that, so, how you sort of yeah, became so tight? Then you dive into that whole history of Pearl Jam and stuff. But there was like, you know, Wooly made Black and White with John Freeman. That was before any of the Krusty Demon stuff that John did. And so it was like, this whole thing like launched all of us. Wow. And, um, and, and then Wooly, that was the last thing he did at Quicksilver. They were touting him to be the next, you know, Danny Kwok, Bob McKnight at the company. And um, he went, no, I'm out of here. He made my film and he left. He retired and started Volcom secretly with Danny Kwok. Did and, he have um, that idea for the intro with you eating the cereal and asking you the questions? Did what? Did he have yeah. that idea of you eating the cereal and him asking yeah, the questions yeah. um, off screen? Well, you know, as an intro, it was kind of like an afterthought, I think, in the editing process. But, yeah, that was all Wooly. So I, I flew out, and Wooly's like, just come stay with me. Freeman's going to be with us. Just stay at my house, and we'll 
we'll, we'll shoot this clip thing and we'll, you know, this marketing thing for quick and we'll get it done like on this trip. He's like, but if you just stay with me, it'll be easier. We can just film and do everything. Like we're always together. So I flew out, stayed with him and I slept on his uh, floor in his room. And he lived, uh, he lived about a block from frog house in Newport in the back there. And, and, um, he put me on the floor in his room and gave me a blanket. And this is not an exaggeration when I say this. He had this cat that had diarrhea really bad, like in the past, okay. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the somewhat distant past. And, the, the, and the, then the cat had diarrhea in multiple places around his room. And so I had to find a place where I wasn't laying in a diarrhea that patch that had dried up. Oh yeah, so he, hadn't, he hadn't cleaned them off his 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 uh, floor, his carpet. So they were just like these hard tufts of carpet and poo that had dried. And so I was like, I just gotta find a spot between those and not roll. That sounds like early twenties like, house hygiene. Like, oh no, that's good. Like when that dries, the smell will go away. All good. We're styling. Yeah. No, there was no smell. It was all good. All good. <laughs> Even if I hit it, I was like, ah, eh, whatever. You know, it's all good. It was kind of turning into dry guano, you know, like, yeah. it's all good. It's just... Skincare. <laughs> brush your shoulder off. <laughs> but, so he would wake me up with the camera in my face every morning, and then we'd drive there, and that's when, you know, we got there, and he just... There was no script or anything. That was all just woolly, and that, that's, you know, that's why Volcom was such a great marketing idea and company, because Wooly was just like, I got control of all the ideas now. I'm, I, I'm just going to throw all this crazy stuff at the wall and see what sticks. It for me like the way that I connect with that intro is so cool because it's fast paced, but it kind of gives a little bit of your personality in there too. But it's fun, and you can tell it's like you're young in it. You know, like it's some of them are so random. Like, like what's your favorite thing about school? Oh, well, actually, my teacher hit me up on the Instagram. He's like, I loved it because he said teachers were his favorite thing about school. I was like, yeah. right on. Yeah, because I, I, you know, I. I would say to this day, I still here and there connect with some of my old teachers, um, you know, and, and I, had, I had a few that really stood out and, and uh, it was, <clears throat> I enjoyed school, you know, I have a lot of great memories from school. I, I, I'm sure that today, in today's age, if there was homeschooling back then, like they have now, I probably would have dropped out of school and ended up homeschooling somehow. I wanted to, but um, there was, a, in, in Surfers, the movie, I believe it was in Surfers the movie, or maybe it was around that time. There was an interview with Mike Stewart, who, you know, obviously Mike's a bodyboarder and the world's greatest body surfer. But back then in the '80s, bodyboarding was like kind of like almost right there with surfing at a lot of levels, you know. And uh, Mike Stewart was one of the biggest stars in surfing, and he was he was one of the main guys in all the ads at Gotcha and you know double page spreads. And anyways, Mike did this interview where he said, you know finish high school there's a problem so the times have changed kids coming up nowadays i mean we're looking at you when you're real young there and your course now and it's cool to hear that you went to school i went to school as well it's changing obviously but how do you think a kid coming up as a surfer it's just that the way that stuff is taken now with instagram it's all instant and do you get on board with that sort of a program or do you put energy or is there any point to it anymore? Never know how and, and, and why it's going to matter later on. <clears throat> but it's brain stimulation, you know. Just because it's not the specific thing you're going to learn doesn't mean that it's not useful in your life. Um, school. I like the social I aspect, too. I, I think school should change. You know, I think uh, it seems like a, a part of what happened with early day schooling, which was created public school systems in America... Um, you know, you can argue this or that point, whether you believe what they teach you or it's good or bad, or there's more essential things you learn, etc. But the simple fact is it's really hard for a kid to focus for an hour and to do that five or six times a day in different classes. So I think also back in the, in the you know, mid century, last, last century, they were trying to figure out like, what do we do with all these kids? We need them to be somewhere big. about their kids because they're at school all day but I don't know that kids can focus for that much time 
that like it'd be kind of cool if there were like 20 or 30 minute classes and they were real specific real to the point boom 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 and you got it done and maybe, you know, teach us how to grow some food and stuff like that, too. And, too, maybe right. this is a time that that could happen. I mean, we're all doing yeah. stuff like this where it is virtual. So maybe, I don't know, who knows? But, I mean, to bring it into a surf perspective for you, for kids. Yeah, well, in high school, I wanted to move to Huntington Beach because they had a surf program. And so I... I that came, rocks. I came, I came really close to moving out to HB when I was, like, uh, 17, around that time. Because I just thought, you know, I can just surf way more. The waves aren't good in Florida, and I have to go to school all day. And I was like, I can go surf before school, during school, and after school. That's the best thing ever. We had it at St. Clemente, too, and it was radical. It was so fun. Yeah. Oh, did yeah, you guys did have it. Yeah. You guys are ahead of the curve. You guys <laughs> in Australia. Australia's there, too. But now we're catching up with Australia with the board riders. Because Australia's always had that. And now that's becoming a thing. And I think that that's really cool for the communities of surf to be able to connect, like getting the young kids to understand. I mean, in San Clemente, a kid who's eight now seeing how gnarly Archie still is and knowing why that's really important is really special, actually, to see. Yeah. It's a tough one, man. You know, if you see some talent in your kid or you want your kid to have a lot of talent, you want to kind of push them a little bit. It's totally understandable by parents, but, you know, you're never going to peak... If you peak before you're 18, you're done. If you're not getting better at 18, 20, even 25 years old, you're done. You're, you don't have a career. So, like, there's no rush to worry about somebody who's 12 or 14. Like, support them. Let them do their thing. But it should be fun. And, you know, I was competing I was competing as much as I could at that age. But zero pressure from my parents. Zero pressure. Literally, like, my mom didn't come to half the contest or more. My dad... I'm not sure if he paid attention when I was in the water half the time. He's having a beer. And I'm not saying that as a passive aggressive thing at him at all. The the cool thing was it made made me strive to like want to impress him, you know, or like like push harder and, and be better and <clears throat> I just took it in a positive. Um, and my dad cared. He took me to all my surf contests and my mom took me to a couple, but but uh um you know, it was just like a part of our lives. It wasn't like Hey, you got to get good and have this career and make money and like start paying bills at the house. There was none of that crap. I just feel like um, you've tapped into something that has given you such a passion for so long. Like that's why I just was curious yeah. your thoughts because it is really different. Like a lot of people arc and then even it almost seems lose that pure love of surfing at some point and then transition away from it where it almost just literally seems like yours is growing into your next steps, which I don't know what they are, but it's just like yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, thanks. No, that's a, and that's the thing. It's got to be fresh for you, and that's that's a big part probably of riding different equipment and trying different fins and boards and shapers and that kind of stuff. And look, I would never be even close to where I'm at without Al. I mean, we all know that Al changed my life on personal and professional levels. You know, he got me, he got me, he gave me my success. Um, you know, but the idea that I'm working with with a lot of different people just I'm totally free in my mind around design. Um, I mean, I get locked into certain branches of things I want to do. And, and there's a certain feel I like, I guess, but, um, uh, the, you know, the freedom to go and design and ride different stuff and, and, and surf different waves, it keeps me excited. Yeah. I, I can't think I'll ever not be excited about going surfing. In my, you know, I'll be like 90 tripping like, the fucking kid, it lowers drop down on me. <laughs> no, dude, you're going to be like, you found the fountain of youth with the wave pole. Like, you're going to keep the thing, f like, finely tuned with equipment and everything and be, like, roundhousing around the grounds at 90. Just, oh! <laughs> my goal, my, my ultimate surf goal is to be barreled at back door at 90. Oh. And just go out there and go, I just take it any wave I want. I don't care if there's a kite work nowadays, it's going to kick my ass. I'm 90. Dude. I can do it. But you have, like, guys like Mike Ho and Derek Ho literally right now, like sort of trailblazing into how barreled you can get later in the game. Yeah. Derek is out there every single swell. And Mike, uh, Mike is a lot, but Derek's literally out there every single day I see him at pipe. Every day it's good. He's out there all day long. And he get, you know, and to, to be honest, and I think, it's a, it, I think it's an awesome thing, Derek is the only guy in the lineup that gets every single wave he wants. And, and I think it's cool because he's yeah. put his time in. Yeah. He's a legend. And, you know, it's, it's so cool. And when I see that crowd of, 
guys all hassling, you know, six, eight, ten guys yelling for a wave and, like, paddling over each other. And you see Derek turn around and everyone stops. I'm like, that's fucking cool. It's so cool. Like, too. Same thing with Mike. Uh, you know, there's a there, – I've, I've seen it. I just don't see Mike out there as much, but the same thing is for Mike. Probably even more so for Mike. I love it. Dude, it's rad. And I'm going to now go into this part just for you to know. Your top five and your backup top five. Yeah, that's a hard one, man. It's a, how do you like? How do you? How do you write down your favorite songs? How do you just how like you the, limit yeah, yourself? How do you write down your favorite surf movies that influenced you as a kid. But I did love, and I talked to Taylor Steele about Seaside and Beyond. So I'm just gonna go through your top five: Surfers, the movie, Seaside and Beyond, Storm Riders, Beyond Blazing Boards, Performers Number One. That was your first list. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Second list to be noted: One Ten Two Forty, Surfers of Fortune, Sipping Jet Streams, Fantasy, September Sessions, and Torpedo People, which is I yes, think come hell or high water. Those are more of like that's more. I guess that would be a little bit more of like a personal list for me because those were films I was involved with mostly. But like Fantasy, like in a section of buttons or. Um, Dude, I've you know, never seen Fantasy. Line. Huh? I've never seen Fantasy. What is it? Yeah, I don't know. I just somebody just gave me it the other day. I hadn't seen it in years. Just one of those old films. That's, is it a Greg Hugland, maybe? I forget who made it. Let me see. I got those. I sent you that clip. I yes, dude, right pull them out. How sick is this? We asked. Yes, this is it. Show the collection right here. These are deep cuts. So, um, years ago, I ran into Dick Hool. And him, he used to make, there used to be Hool McCoy films, right? And so um, he, he gave me like, I forget how many videos, um, but uh, so he. So the other day, a buddy of mine. Do you do you possibly follow uh, Ho Daddy Surf? No, but I need to. That sounds amazing. You gotta go on Ho Daddy Surf. That's my buddy Andrew. He's from um, like down Lenox, uh, Byron area. Okay. And he posts all this classic old stuff. But yeah, Ho Daddy Surf. So Andrew gave me these. We play golf together, but the other day he goes, I got some films you might like. Okay, so There's what is that? Is it swells. tubular swells? Yes. Boom. Storm Rider. So, oh, what? How's that cover art? Are you kidding yeah, me? The cover is, um, it's Jerry, MR, Dane, Rabbit, Bugs. Their faces are all all on there, if you can get <laughs> that. Oh, my God. What about how good Dane Kealoha was at Backdoor? Are you kidding me? Hey, Dane was... Dude, Dan was riding five ten twin fins at like maxing back door. He and he and in my opinion, Dane had the best tube stance and style of anyone of all time. I remember I was down in you know, I was a huge fan of Dane's. Um, and I was down in King Island one time with, with Derek Hind and um, Joe Curran and Chad Campbell and actually Eddie Vetter came with us on that trip. And there was this one, this one day this east swell came and there was these reeling like cure like barrels breaking right next to the shore. And I remember I got this one wave and the way I stood, I was like, like in my mind, I was like a little kid again. I'm like, oh, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm like trying to look like Dane right now. You know, the way I was. But I see it on the way that you, the way you sit back on your board on a foam ball on your forehand, I feel like is really Dane Kiloa because he's pumping and then it hits and he's so big that he was able to yeah, like. Dane would get right back. He had a really strong, he had just crazy strong legs, but he would just, he'd kind of like cock his head a little bit and get this like way he would hold his arm. Anyways, I remember doing that on one wave and I was like, oh, I'm trying to like be like Dane, you know. <laughs> so and, like... uh, and I piled back out and Derek goes, you know. You looked a lot like Dane K. Loha right there. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit, I love it. Okay, but you probably played it off like, oh, really? That's cool. Like, I wasn't even thinking about it. And it's just like inside, you're like, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Innermost Limits. There we go. You know, gotta have that. Uh, this one, I, I don't really know. I'm going to have to dig into this one. High on a cool wave. What? Hi is that the origination of a high line? I don't know. <laughs> And then uh, the fantastic plastic machine. And that one I don't know either. Yeah, so uh, I got to dive into that. The era is 1969 after Nat Young shocked Americans. Wow. Becoming the world surfing champion in 66. America's best compete from Wenatchee Club. America's best surfers from Wenatchee Club came to Australia to compete against Australia's best, settling the controversy. Which country had the best surfers? And surfing supremacy. Wasn't there something weird like McTavish and the Thruster and? Um... Well, right here. This is this movie features Nat Young, McTavish, Greeno, Ted Spencer, um, Mike Purpose, 
Oh, uh, my gosh. Munoz, Steve Bigler, Skip Fry, Mitch Fer- Midget Farrelly, Russell Hughes, um, Margo Oberg. Like that is pretty classic era right there. I got to watch that one. Dude, I haven't seen that one. We might have to have you host an outreach day where you, you, you somehow film your screen and just let the people see that. It's hard, though. It's hard to have... If you don't have the copies of these movies, like how are you going to see them? I don't know, man. Can you bring them back? <laughs> yeah, they're, it's like it's uh, in Australia. They say it's rare as hen's teeth. I love that. Australians have the strangest sort of slogans that you sometimes they go right over your head. <laughs> Shit, the oh, bed, yeah. Slang, yeah. Um, we should. Uh, we should like. Maybe cover just any of the other history on black and white, just to cover that one up. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. We should bring it back before we play it. So bring us in. Yeah. So, so um, it was just looking back now. I can't can't believe how much of an impact that had with people. Years ago, I was in Coolangatta in a hotel in a, a condo, staying there, and the, there was a guy in the building next to me, and he starts going, "Oi, Kelly!" And he starts yelling at me, and he starts screaming for, I'm not joking, for five straight minutes, he quoted black and white. And I was like, how do I not have a camera right now? I just wish I could could capture this, that it was that influential in someone's life, some guy I never met. But you must hear so that. Crazy. It's it's literally like the most iconic, it's the morning of the finals. Like, you must hear that all the time. The morning of the finals, like, it, it, it's just, uh, the things Wooly said in there, the way that it's funny because it's like it's, it almost looks planned out or something, but it was just an innocence. Wooly goes, "Look, I got like a hundred questions. I'm just gonna ask you all these questions, and they're kind of stupid, and they're kind of funny, and they're you know maybe some are insightful." Um, it's the perfect combo because you spit your cereal out when he asks you if you like typing. Uh, yeah, Taylor steals on here. Taylor says black and white was quoted every day for a year with my friends. <laughs> yeah, it's dude. A wild, dude. And, <clears throat> but <clears throat> and. And we'll dive into other films like Performers, but Performers was like the original Taylor Still movie, because um, it had sections on each of the different surfers. How and many performers were there? I'm sorry if that's off topic, but no, it's not off topic. I mean, we can go. There. I don't know what else there is to clear up about Black and White. It was just, it was a, it was just such an, such an exciting time for me, launching my career. It came out right as I was turning eighteen, right as I was about to turn nineteen. Um, and then to look back and see like Freeman went into the Krusty Demons thing and all that, it was like, oh, that's so cool that like we were connected before all that happened. And, and then to see Wooly start Volcom and, and get into that whole world. And my brother, Sean, left Quicksilver to go work for Volcom. Sean was a fourth employee, worked for him for 21 years. Um, I like too that the employees at that time, because Sean is in Stony Baloney. He's a yeah. part of the surf yeah. movies like it wasn't just like oh i work for the brand it's like i embody it so hard like i'm doing everything with the crew which i think is pretty cool yeah, yeah. it was well they just had a, they had their own culture you know Wooly's culture was surf skate snowboard music and um you know quicksilver wanted to capitalize on those things but they couldn't they were surf and Wooly was more than that you know Wooly was he was he was more diverse than what the quicksilver origin was if if that makes sense you know that's well, not a slant on quick at all but quick was guys making surf trucks in the back of their house you know they're in the garage and selling them out of their car and woolly was like wait i go snowboarding all the time i hang out with all these bands i'm into skating more than i'm surfing most days like i go on surf trips so it's like Holcomb encompassed all that for him and he he saw i think he saw the holes in the the holes in the game at Quicksilver in his mind and thought I'll go and start that and I remember him telling me he was going to leave he was leaving Quicksilver and I was like what you're going to be like high paid like way up there you're going to be the top guy one day like what are you thinking he's like no I'm going to start this thing and you know for like the first two years Sean was repping him and he had this rack of clothes in the house and there were like orange cow print shorts that were passed down halfway down to your ankle past your knee and Sean's like, dude, I can't sell this shit. It's like, what is this crap? <laughs> it was just such, he was taking such a risk. It was like, uh, you know, in my mind, I was thinking, take all that risk with the marketing, not with the product, you know. Um, like, just sell some clothes. But, you know, they figured it out. It just took a little while. But he, he was just in this fun party zone, and, that, yeah. and uh, it was all coming out. Do you feel like for you, because you've worked with so many different people, Wooly on this one in the <laughs> beginning, but, like, do you have somebody that you really identify with? 
that you feel like over the course of your career you've come back to? Obviously, Taylor Steele's huge. We kind of don't, I mean, that might be the answer, but was there somebody that you felt like creatively, yeah, that you aligned with really well? Um, yeah, I mean, probably Taylor. I think Taylor and I probably, um, I mean, we've worked on a diverse number of product projects, you know, it was yeah. early just like sleep in the house, let's go surf seaside and oceanside and get some clips. And then it became more of like tippy jet stream stuff, specific trips for one section. Um, uh, and, and I think we've, you know, we've, 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 we've spoken a lot about making different things that we haven't done or like ideas we have. I think we're just, I think ideas are easy. It's just the time it's hard to find, but I've been working with Alec Parker the last couple of years, like three years. And, you know, Alec and I have a bunch of ideas. Um, you know, I think we're going to end up starting a YouTube channel and, and, um, we've been, we've been working on a film for over a year right now for about a year <clears throat> and, um, kind of a signature film on the, on the core last year. You know, there's a lot of, just a lot of things you can't predict happen, and, um, you know, we covered most of that. I think it's really cool, because you've really brought people inside of what tour life is like, because if you're not on the tour, it's hard to really know how deep it is, and how deep it can hit, and it's cool, you've always done that, I feel like, which is, as a surf fan, it's like, that, I mean, not only were you the greatest surfer of all time, but like, for us, we could tangibly grab onto those things and be like, what, that's rad, you know? You know, it's fun for me to share it because it's all, it's part of, it's, it's some little thread to everybody's world that surfs. You know, we all got our own, own little story and obviously the average surfer, you never hear about it, but you know, if you can share something that's a little more interesting than I did an air reverse this morning. Totally. You know, I think it's, I think, I think it's important to do that. Well, that's why, I mean, honestly, thank you for taking the time on this because that's the whole goal with these is to give the insight into where you were at at these times. And for us growing up, it's hard because you've always been sort of goatliness to us, but it's like you at those times when you were young, having to like prove yourself in Hawaii or earn your stripes off the team. Like it's just cool stories that make it for kids coming up to know that, I don't know, like it's just a coming of age tale, really. It's a, well, it's such a different world now. There's so many more people surfing. There's so many more guys charging, you know, pipelines always for, Pipeline's always been our epicenter, right? And and um, luckily now we found all these other waves around the world, Tropu and um, you know waves like Nazare or Mulligmore or yeah. uh, all these different things around the world. But I don't know if I'd want to be a little Grom right now because <laughs> honestly, it's like it's super crowded. You're gonna get fewer waves at at, at backdoor and pipe than we ever did because there's just way more of you. And um, but the pressure also like. When I was a kid, a big wave was like one that might close out Y man. Now it's like, holy shit, you gotta surf giant outer reefs, you gotta charge jaws, you gotta tow at Nazare. Like there's all these crazy things that you might have to do if you wanna be a complete surfer now. Totally. And um, Kai Lenny's doing them all. I mean, basically he is, but it is true. Like that aspect was so romantic with big wave. You always were Eddie, like men who rode mountains. Like, and it was romantic and you could kind of get into that realm because it was kind of more accessible. Now it's like, if you want to consider yourself a big wave surfer, you've probably had to take at least 10 two wave hold downs that have been like life challenging moments to even like think like, Oh yeah, I'd lightly mention I'm a big wave surfer. Like the game is so high now. Oh, and on that note, we'll just, you know, keep talking about, <laughs> let's see what's up. We'll call him back. We'll see if he's on. That was fun, though. Gosh, Kelly, dude. The guy is so cool this time. I feel like we could just talk forever, but I, I'll bring it back. Black and white. Send it. Big time. Here we go. I just, You know how I just get so frothy. I do. I just froth. Uh, Maybe this isn't. Maybe. We'll see what's going to happen here. Are you sure? Let's end it. That one had to, oh, cool, so fun. That's a fun game. Okay, delete that. True life, I'm not the best with my technology. If Kelly's, uh, if, if we don't get, oh, here's Kelly. What do you say? 
Want to jump back on and finish up? Yeah. What do we got? Are we waiting? This stuff is kind of it's kind of hard here. Let's see. Come on, Kelly. Where are you at? Do I need to go do a new one? Come on. This is cool though. I'm learning how to do lives. Oh, Kelly, let's see what he says. Okay, going. Okay, he says going. Okay. Here we go. We're going. What is up? I don't know how to work this thing. Come on, Kelly. What are we doing? How do I do it? I want to do it, but I can't. Okay, maybe it's on. No. <laughs> oh, we'll see. Either way, we'll throw in the vid. And then if I get it out, I don't know how to do it, though. Standing by. I'm here. I'm here. I'm now live. You know what? If all else fails. You just gotta FaceTime the goat. That's what you do. That's all you can do. Just gotta send up a FaceTime. <laughs> Kelly. Gosh, I was trying to go live again. I'm so sorry. I don't know how to do it, dude. I'm like, I'm just working it out over here. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time, Kelly. I got it right here. I'm about to pop it in. So, any last words? No, it's just. <clears throat> Um, which one do you pop in it, black and white? Yeah, dude, we already marinated in color, and I can't believe how good the soundtrack is on that thing. Oh, it's pretty good, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, we had the, uh, gosh, who all was on there? I'm trying to think right now of the names. There's, like, a one song that I tried Cal, to find. How Crater Boys are on there. Intro. Which is cool. I, I, I picked that one to be on there. That was I was really into those guys. Dude, that's the that honestly makes you feel so good when you hear that song. Yeah. yeah. What, what about there's one um, Pollyanna? I know this is really random, but it's uh your '96 Pipe Masters. It's all small. The song title is Rail Ride. Rail Ride on down. I sorry. have to watch it again. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I just tried to sing a song, which is random. Sorry about that, dude. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, but thanks, Kelly. I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's fun. Um, it's fun to go, go dive into all those memories, and you, you know, we didn't get too much into people's uh, comment commentary on the side of the screen. Um, you know, because there's just so much to kind of talk about and remember already. Yeah. Without any questions, but it's definitely been fun. You know, working with Taylor has been awesome. Working with Brian Blake, uh, all the early Quicksilver one ten two forty Surfers of Fortune. Um, also, Don King, Jeff Hornbaker. Um, work with those guys a ton. Um, I even worked with Albie Falzon a little bit. Morning of the um, Earth. Yeah. Oh, wow. He did a he did a, a Quicksilver G Land film during one of the years. No way. <clears throat> I think in like '96 or '7. Yeah. What about Quick Country? Yeah. Huh? What about Quick Country? Quick Country. Yeah, that was uh, 
I think that that was me and Timmy Curran in 96 at Chopu, and we had it to ourselves on like a 10-foot day. Whoa. Nobody, we didn't see anyone the whole day. Tom Carroll had busted his eardrum the day before. His tail split his helmet open and busted his eardrum, knocked him out. He probably would have died if he didn't have his helmet on. What? Had the helmet yeah. on? Tom, yeah, watch that footage. And then there's a, there's a, there's a wave in that movie. We're surfing this other place, Mara, that no one surfs anymore. You know that wave? No. It's is... like before you get to Papara. It's like 10 minutes before Papara. Okay. When you're driving from, from town. Okay. And it's the gnarliest left, dude. You're in the barrel, and a thing barrels underneath you, and you free fall over it. There's like a, it's like a barrel inside a barrel. But watch, there's a clip of Tom in there, and he's in the barrel, and he goes, he, he does a floater on another barrel inside the barrel of the wave. Is that the and wave? Does it get big? Is that what the one that Wassel and those guys were towing? No, that was Sapi Noose. Oh, oh, yeah. That's, that's right. like a, that one's kind of like, no one really surfs it because the bodyboard is kind of taking it over and they just rule the place. And it's like, it sounds like it's not really worth going out there for most people because you just don't get waves. But, you know, it's turned like, that's the bodyboard spot. Chope was the surf spot for the most part. But um, this wave mod, ah, like, it, it was on the radar heavy when I first used to go to Tahiti. And now it's like, no one talks about it or surfs it. There's a big right across the channel. But when you kick out, there is dry reef in the channel, and the wave doesn't break on the dry reef. It's the weirdest thing ever. I love this. But, yeah, that's all. It was just me, Tom Curran, and Tom, uh, uh, Tim Curran and Tom Carroll on that trip. And the craziest, I'll tell you a quick story. The craziest thing happened. We were in this big van, and it had no windows. <clears throat> and it had no, no seats, and we would just throw all our gear in it, and we'd go drive around and look for waves if we weren't surfing Chopu. But most days we surf Chopu. And um, there weren't many guys there. I remember Carlos Burley was there, and Taylor Knox was there, and a couple other guys. But the most crowded I ever saw Chopo the whole time I was there was like maybe eight guys out. Is this before Holy Water? Like, is this all before the this Gotcha is, Contest? This is 96. Okay. Yeah, and um, so no one was really out there. We There was a couple houses you could, like, rent a house and whatever, but there was no, there was just no, nothing going on, really. It was no, there was no Chopo back then, you know what I mean? It wasn't a thing. And um, so we're in this van, and we go. To, we're, we're going looking for waves elsewhere on the island, and we, we're by Mara, uh, a little bit towards town from there. And we parked. I forget what Tom was doing. Oh, we were. We all sat in the back. There's two seats up front, and then three of us, or three or four of us, would sit in the back. And we had like those lawn chairs, and we just sit in them in the car, right? And you just like slide all around this van, and. Um, It'd be funny to ask Timmy Curran this if you ever get Timmy on. And um, we we parked we parked on the side of the road where you're, where you were supposed to park. Tom just wanted to get out and go look at the ocean or run and do something. He parked the van, and there was a street right there. And behind us, if you're looking right behind us, we were blocking the view of a little bridge coming towards us. And right before the bridge, there was a turn. So it would turn bridge, and then you would pass us. Okay. And then there's this. And, and so we created like this big blind spot. It's actually, is, you're like, you're not going to smile in a minute. It's the craziest story. Dude, I always smile. I'm sorry. Yeah, you, know, you, might, you might be uncomfortable. So <laughs> we're, and Tom literally maybe got out of the car for like one or two minutes. And this guy comes up to the, to the road to get onto the highway. And he's got a girl on the back of his motorcycle. And they pull up and... Um, oh, no. They pull up to the road and he can't see. I see him trying to look and he can't see past our van. And he's like, oh, fuck it. I'm just going to go for it. He goes and his car hits him at about 50 miles an hour. He's 20 yards from me. Dude. But he gets hit. No, but, but it's, he didn't die. Okay. But it was gnarly. So the, the, the way the car hit him, it's, it hit his leg and it threw him off. And the girl, it didn't hit her. It just like... Because, because of how forcefully it hit the motorcycle, it just moved the cycle off from under her, and she kind of fell backwards and was standing. What? She was totally fine. Oh, she my gosh. And they, but the guy got hit, and his leg got smashed between the car and the motorcycle, and, like, for sure broke his leg really badly, and he was unconscious. And his helmet flew, like, 50 yards off his head. And um, he was in an ambulance in, like, under five minutes. There was, a, there was an ambulance station right there on that street. And they just basically pulled out and put him in the ambulance. And um, he lived. He was okay. But it, oh was like, it was one of the gnarliest things I've ever seen. <laughs> that is like when a surf trip goes terribly wrong. Like... Terribly wrong. And I was like, 
Tom felt horrible, but I didn't want to blame, like, you shouldn't have parked there. You know, it was just like one of those things. Like, yeah. Park around, look at the waves. For sure. It, and, you know, but that guy just didn't make sure there was no car. He just went, I just remember him, like, looking, going, I'll go. And he went, and I watched it, like, in slow motion. I was like, no! Yeah, wow. Well. You know? Crazy. So, I mean, even just thinking back in the old school days, like, the way that everything was just p- kind of cowboy. Like, you're in the back of that car in lawn chairs, just firing up, like, yeah. <laughs> No, big deal. no, we're good. Um, yeah, well, I mean, gosh, Kelly, I really appreciate it. I hope we did all right. We talked through the movies. We didn't really go too deep, but black and white, I feel like we got some nuggets of joy out of you. So, yeah, well, and when you go to when you go into Storm Riders, like um, there's some good stuff from MR in there. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the session with uh, Joe Angle and Thornton uh, Philander. They go to Neos. And um, a Japanese guy gets, like, somebody duck dives away and his board comes out and hits the guy in the face. You ever seen that clip? No, not it's at all. this movie. This, this Japanese guy's in the barrel and somebody duck dives and their, their, their pintail lodges loose from their hands and shoots the guy in the face. Oh. So gnarly. Um, but, uh, I think it's really cool, though, because your kind of m- movies do touch on the way that mine would touch. My top five is kind of your guys' generation list. And it's sick. Like, you have MR, you got... Well, C7 Beyond's not there, but... Soundtrack, like Ganga Jang and Huda Gurus. Like, the soundtrack from that film is crazy. And it's all, like, Gold Coast early and all that stuff. And um, the Boa Pairs and... Um, <clears throat> there was one called uh, Sand Surfers Against Nuclear Destruction that they ran up in, um, like, Bundaberg or somewhere up past the Sunshine Coast. But Aki does this air in that movie that's out of hand. Have you seen that? No. Is that one of the oh. first airs at Frontside, like... like yeah, with- he, like rotates backwards and sticks it and lands it and i remember keckley telling me that he was in that heat and when he saw aki do that he just paddled in I told aki that story like 20 years later i told aki that story i'm like yeah keckley told me he was like out in that thing and he just paddled in he goes yeah mate they all paddled in <laughs> <laughs> yes oh, I love so it. Good. dude you're the man kelly thank you brother yeah but have a all great right. day okay bye. we'll see, see you soon Bye.